properties of matter. So let's jump into our first sort of module, um, if you'd like to talk about it like that, um, and essentially what we're actually going to be going through. So properties of matter, I want you to explore the, the homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures through practical investigation. So what do these two words mean? Because they're two very distinct terms that you may not actually understand what they mean. So homogeneous means a mixture that is uniform in composition throughout. So what that essentially means is that the mixture is everything that is the same. So it might be water with salt and everything is salt. Heterogeneous is a mixture which has variations to its composition throughout. So what that means is that you may have different things in that mixture. Um, and I like to think of it like this. So you've got matter and you've got matter that sort of breaks down into this little flow chart. You've got anything that occupies space has a mass, is composed of atoms, etc. And then you've got pure substances and then you've got mixtures. Now, mixtures are two or more pure substances bonded together. Homogenous are uniform in composition throughout. So they're going to be, as I said, everything's going to be the same. So even if there's a pattern to it, it's all going to be the same. If it's not a pattern, then it's going to be heterogeneous. Now, that might mean that the two mixtures you've put together don't like each other. Now, you're going to learn a, about a thing called polarity. Polarity is whether something has a slight charge or not. Now, if something has a slight charge, it is polar. Water is polar. If it doesn't, it's going to be called non-polar. Now, something is non-polar is oil, fats. Now, if you think about a cup of water and you pour some oil in, what happens? It makes those weird blobby bits that don't mix in. You can never mix the oil in. No matter how much you mix it, it will never mix in. You get these little fat, round, oil bits that just sort of clump in. Eventually the oil moves to the bottom because the oil is heavier than water. Now, what's really important about that is that is a heterogeneous mixture because you've got one thing in one spot and you've got another thing in another spot. Um, it's not sort of uniform. They're not mixing together. It's not very good. Now you also have pure substances. So this is one type of atom or molecule with distinct measurable properties. So compounds, these have two or more elements bonded together. Elements are essentially one type of atom. So if I said I have a, um, let's just say I had oxygen gas, that's an element because it's just, as much as it's a compound, there's two um, oxygens together. We call an element because it's just oxygen. That's probably a terrible example. Let's just say I have aluminium metal. I have pure aluminium metal. Pure aluminium metal, it's one type of atom. It's only aluminium, therefore it's going to be really hard metal. Compounds, on the other hand, if I did like a, an aluminium alloy, so if I did the aluminium alloy, it would, you know, it had, it's al aluminium mixed with something else. And essentially that's a compound. So as you can see here, this is one of those things, heterogeneous mixture. So if you sort of went, it's particles distributed non-uniformly. So as you can see here, there's a uniform mixture. Particles that, homogeneous are particles that uh, have a, you know, a pattern, they're a, Distribution is uniform, so things like rain, steel, other things there. So that's a really good way of thinking about it. Now, we also like to talk about with these is our physical and our chemical properties. So what are our physical properties of, of atoms and molecules? What are our chemical properties? So they're two very distinct things, and it's really important you understand the differences between, between them. So physical properties are essentially properties that can be observed and measured without changing the substance. Chemical properties, on the other hand, are essentially properties described on how readily a substance undergoes a chemical change. So, with those things in mind, I like to think of things like acids and bases. So, we understand that acids and bases don't like to join together. They go, no, we don't like each other. And so, therefore, they like to, you know, they like to react with each other. That's a chemical property, that acids don't like bases and bases don't like acids. However, a physical property such as the color of an acid is you don't have to measure sort of the change. You can just keep the substance there and look at the color to test how strong an acid is. You need to sort of react it with a base. That's a really important thing. That's a chemical change. You need to go through some sort of chemical change to measure it. Um, flammability. So if I wanted to see if an acid is flammable, I'd have to set it light. I have to put some fire on it. I'm applying a chemical change. And that's really important. Um, so quick question, is boiling point of a substance a physical or a chemical property? What do we think? What is it? It's physical or chemical? It's a bit of both. 
It's actually a really, really important thing. So boiling points are kind of both physical and chemical. It's a really terrible circle. It should have been somewhere like in more in the middle. It's, it's a bit of both because essentially we have got to change it a little bit and it has got to do with the chemical properties of it. So it's got to do with the bonds that are, that are between molecules and we will discuss that further. It's actually at the end of this lecture, I think, we discuss bonds. Um, I remember going through this and I was like, hey, there's bonds. Bonds are one of the most common things you need to learn. It's one of the things that you'll find the most useful out of today. So bonds determine boiling point. But at the same time, it kind of is a physical property because it physically changes what's going on and it's something that you can sort of just observe. A little bit of an obscure one, but don't worry too much about it if it's not making too much sense. Now, what we like to do with understanding that we have physical and chemical properties is we like to then discuss, all right, what are our separation techniques? What are we actually going to do to, you know, look at different molecules, different mixtures, different everything that's going on? Now, there are two main methods of physical separation, filtration and evaporation. Chromatography is not as common, um, but it is one of the methods you can utilize. So don't worry, we won't probably discuss that as much today. We will discuss filtration and evaporation. Um, these two are, reply, are classified as physical methods as they rely on differences in physical properties of the components um, of the mixture. So what we want is we use filtration and evaporation to essentially, if we've got a mixture of all these different molecules and we want to separate them out, we use their physical properties to separate them. We go, all right, you have a lower boiling point, you have a higher, higher boiling point. You um, have a different color, you have this color. You have something else. You know, there's plenty of different physical properties you could use. Essentially, we look at those physical properties and we go, all right, you have this, you have that. How can we break them apart? So um, essentially, as you can say, these are classified as physical properties as they rely on differences in the mixture. So filtration and evaporation, how do they work? Filtration is about particle size and solubility. Now, solubility is the ability for something to um, absorb into water, um, and it is a physical property. So, a description. When a mixture is passed through a filter, the insoluble solid is blocked by its physical barrier uh, whilst liquid passes through the filter. So, essentially what happens is you'll find that you get a filter. It's like a coffee filter in a sense, and you pour your sort of, you mixture through it and you want to separate it out. And essentially what you do is you separate your two, um, your solids from your non-solids and essentially the liquid passes through and it's filtered. Now evaporation is really interesting one. There's sort of two main ones. Distillation is probably more common than crystallization, but we'll discuss it very quickly. Crystallization is when you have solids and a liquid. And essentially when the mixture is heated up, the liquid evaporates to form a solid solute. So essentially what happens is, um, the liquid evaporates and as the liquid moves away, you're left with just solids. You're left with just the crystals that were in the liquid and that's all you want. So that's what you're looking for there. Distillation on the other hand is where you have two different liquids and what you do is you essentially just boil these two liquids. So you get these two liquids and you boil them. So they're, they're mixed in together. It's a mixture. So you're essentially boiling one mixture. So you boil off that mixture. And essentially what happens is the liquid with the lower boiling point will evaporate first. It will become, you know, a gas first. And as it becomes a gas, it moves up into a tube. This is what it'll look like. It's like a tube. I'll, I hope there's a photo of it. I think there's a photo of it coming up. Um, there is. But essentially it evaporates. I'm going to get that photo of it. It's a much better way of explaining it. Essentially what happens is you get this liquid and it boils. And the first thing, the first component the, the one with the lower boiling point will boil first. Essentially, as it does is it boils up and it hits this and it gets pushed down into this tube. Essentially, this tube is, essentially, is called a condenser. And what happens is water runs around this tube. So this tube has like a double layer. It's like one layer and another layer. In this outer layer, there is no gas there. The gas from this mixture is in the middle layer. The outer layer is like a pump and it pumps cold water through it. And that cold water is running around that inner layer and that inner layer is really cold. So essentially when the gas goes in here, it gets in this really, really cold environment and immediately it becomes a liquid again. And you've made this tube in such a way, it's not going to be able to escape back in there. It's going to go down in here. And essentially you get this distillation. You get this liquid coming out, which is different to the mixture. It's essentially one component of the mixture. So you keep boiling this or all at whatever temperature it is that the first thing boils 
and you keep it at that temperature and you boil off all of the mixture that was in there of the one part that was at that boiling point and it should come out as a distilled component and eventually you'll be left with the perfect amount of what you had of the other component. So that's what that looks like there. Distillation is easily the most common. Distillation occurs with sort of crude oil, which is our raw version of our petrol, um, something that you'll see a lot. It also happens with things like gins. So if you've heard of a gin and it's an alcoholic spirit, um, you distill gins a lot, um, especially with sort of ethanol components and so forth. You also do it with other spirits, um, but you'll see that that's sort of how that works. Um, now there's also some other separation techniques that are slightly different. Uh, there's decay to your centrifuge. Now, centrifuging is used in medical terms a lot. So, maybe in sort of medical research, we use the centrifuge to separate blood samples. Um, it's the most common use of it. Decanting, on the other hand, is a little bit different. You essentially use gravity to separate substances. So, you use the principle that a lighter substance will float to the top while a heavier substance sinks. And you sort of leave things over a period of time and you look at the density. So, you sort of... Um, it's interesting because you sort of leave a mixture, you sort of make a mixture, you get a mixture and you leave it over a period of time in a certain position. And over a certain period of time, you should, they, they should separate and you sort of pour out that first part. Essentially, that's how you separate it. Not as accurate as centrifuging. Centri centrifuging is doing that in a much quicker terms. Essentially, what you do is you spin the sample. So you put a sample in and you spin it. And you spin it really, really quickly. Um, and I think there's a photo of it. Um, as I was going through, yes, this is centrifuging. You put a sample in and essentially it spins really, really, really quickly. And essentially what happens is the heavier sort of substances end up at the bottom of the tube. They end up further away and the lighter substances end up more at the top of the tube. And when that stops spinning, you're left with all the, the heavy content at the bottom and all the light content at the top. And essentially you can from there you can essentially go through and pull out everything else that you have there. Now, just quickly, here's some photos of all the techniques. So you had, this would be uh, your filtration. As you can see here, you've got filter paper, you put you get your residue out, you get your liquid at the bottom. This would be uh, part of your evaporation or your distillation sort of technique. So here's your evaporation. You hope that you sort of end up with a, a solid at the bottom if you're gonna use crystallization. Here's your distillation. Um, and then this is sort of your centrifuging. Um, we didn't really go through, there's no photo of decanting because decanting, there's nothing to do. You essentially just leave it over a period of time. Pretty boring technique, nothing to do. So from here, what's really important to understand is that um, the percentage composition is something that you would then measure from this. So you've been given essentially the mass of a mixture and you want to figure out what percentage is one element or one, you know, compound within that mixture. So this is really interchangeable. So as much as this is, this is written in a way that it says percentage by mass, you can also do this in terms of percentage by mixture. It's the exact same technique. So if I, let's just say, interchange this word of massive compound for massive mixture. So if I had a mixture and I said the mixture was 30 grams, and then I, you know, I went through either centrifuging or I went through distillation or some other technique. And I'm left with, I pulled out 10 grams of what I wanted, or maybe we'll say 15 grams of what I wanted. And one of the components was 15 grams. I would then put 15 over 30 times by 100, I'd end up with 50%. So I'd say that 50% of my mixture was whatever it was that I wanted. Maybe it was like a salt or something that I've got out. However, you can also do this by compound. So if you have a compound and you want to figure out what elements are in there and you use one of the techniques, you use actually, you'd have to use a different technique because you have to look at chemicals, but nonetheless, you find that there is five grams of this element in there when I had 40 grams of the compound. Essentially, you then go five divided by 40 times by 100 and you get your answer you want. So it's really important to understand that that as much as that would be, what, 5%, um, your, your terms on this calculation or this formula can be interchangeable. So percentage composition is a really, really useful, um, really useful sort of uh, formulae. 
Also important um, that a common, mistake is ha a common mistake is having different units for the denominator. Please don't have different units as a denominator. That wouldn't work very well. Um, it allows us to numerically express how much of a substance um, is present in a mixture or a compound, essentially what you want to look at. Um, so as you can see here, this is an example. Given that there is 50 grams of copper in a 2.5 kilogram sample of metallic mixture, what is the percentage mass of copper? So this is what we we're trying to say just in that last slide. You need to be really, really careful with these questions. You need to be sort of switched on to what is going on. You've been given 50 grams as grams. You've been given 2.5 kilograms. So therefore, you need to be able to interchange those two. You need to say, all right, what is kilograms? What is grams? And sort of mix the, and get the right one. So you could have done this in kilograms. If you wanted to, you could have said, all right, that is 0 0.05 kilograms. Go for your life. You could have said that. You can also say 50 grams divided by 2,500 grams, which is a much easier way of doing it. I prefer that way over the other way. Um, but beyond that, uh, you do your calculation times by 100, 0 0.02 divided by 100, 2%. That's how you go about those questions. So fairly straightforward type questions. Um, I would hope that there's not too much issue with these, um, but that's sort of how you're going to go about it.